So one of the things that's really necessary, of course, is to figure out how does your public art program actually fit within the larger mission of your organization if you sit within another organization. And so being part of the Alliance, we're also interested in how it's important to the entire district and how it's important to the city of New York. So our president often talks about the success of a great public space is based on these three elements. You have to design it, you have to manage it, and you have to program it well. It was really important that we really rethought what is a tourist. Often we use this term as a very derogatory term, and no one wants tourists, and no one wants to be near tourists, and I don't want to be like a tourist. But we're all tourists because we've left and we've gone somewhere else. If you're sitting in San Marco Square, you're a tourist as well. So we found out when I worked with the economic development team that 47% of our tourists are international. The median income is actually over $100,000, and most people have achieved a high level of education. And most importantly for Times Square specifically, tourists come here because they want to see something that they may not be able to see at home. This was really key because this started to turn our perception of what we could do here as being an ideal audience for contemporary art. As we are a daily place, of 400,000 people, we have something that we can offer to them. We have visibility and we have audience numbers. But this also means because we have consistent audience numbers that we actually have a responsibility to take risks. So we wanted to think about with our two funders for this year, Art Place and Art Works, to take advantage of who we are and also to say that we are going to be a test bed and we want to try and talk to you about any of our learning lessons and we want to be transparent. It's, it's great that I'm following you, Sharon, because when you said you don't own anything, the commissioner would like to say, uh, you think that Donald Trump owns a lot of real estate. DOT owns right, the, the most real estate probably of anybody in the city. The issue before she came was that um, that land space, that many, many miles of uh, land and bridges that DOT um, operates and owns was really um, focused on moving cars a lot rather than people. And with a simple change of language um, from moving cars and vehicles to moving people, that sort of changed the whole dialogue about what we do. And the question is, when you start a program like this, how do you begin to insinuate yourself into the DNA in, 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 into an agency like that? And that's what we do. We've installed over 130 objects in the last six years because we try to work fast within the large bureaucracy. We try to have processes that things within two weeks. Uh, we have selection periods like twice a, a year for partners projects. So those are the important things that we've developed in the last six years and um, hopefully we'll continue to do a lot more projects. What is Governor's Island? Okay, It is, um, as Patricia said, it's a 172 acre island in the middle of New York Harbor. It was a military base. So it was literally never open to the public. I grew up here. I had never heard of it in my entire life. Um, it's about 800 yards from Manhattan. Um, 300 yards from Brooklyn, and it is accessible only by boat. So our strategy was, at the time, sort of heretical, because we started with the question, what does New York not have? And for those of you who are not from New York, this is the most parochial, snottiest place on the planet. And if you talk to people in the cultural community, with the exception of me, well, actually, the people here, but um, I remember, no, actually, quite representative of the, um, the notion that there could be, that New York could be missing something was actually completely heretical. So we then took the other opposite approach is we didn't build anything, right? New York is all about building big things. We just said, if you encourage it, they will come. Be open to what can happen, even while you plan for it. Um, when you run an island, you have to deal with a lot of logistics, uh, security, boats, all those kinds of things. It's not just how art changes a place when you're in the moment, but when you come back to that place. The opportunity for artists to respond and interpret and then add their own layers of meaning is really a sort of too unique uh, for us to pass that up. The creative time came from a very different uh, um, kind of instinct. Uh, the idea was to give artists opportunities to experiment, to try new things that if they had opportunities to grow their practice, they would in fact uh, push culture forward perhaps and also push uh, culture at large and you know society forward. The, the organization has been defined by three core values. Number one, that it's important for artists to experiment. Number two, that public spaces are places for free and creative expression. And number three, that there's no door an artist shouldn't kick in, kick open. Uh, that that um, artists should be really weighing in on the times in which we live and contributing to public ideas and public life. And increasingly, 
Creative Time is looking beyond New York City where there's so many great public arts presenters and across the country and even internationally. And in particular, we're interested in artists helping to engage with communities and people who are in, in places in crisis. We are going to be commissioning five artists to create um, installations that are, have a kind of sustainable, long-lasting uh, presence with local community organizations and businesses in the historic neighborhood of Weeksville. Weeksville was founded in the 1820s. It was the first self-defined African-American home-owning community in, in uh, the state, if not the country. And uh, why did they need to do this? Because in order to vote in America, you needed to be free, you needed to own real estate, and you needed to be a man. So uh, there are four historic homes left. They're, it's situated between Crown Heights and Brownsville. It's an incredibly rich uh, cultural neighborhood, uh, but that is incredibly underserved, and we're hoping that having these artist activations and long-term commitments will bring uh, some new cultural vitality to the neighborhood. And I think my point is to also emphasize the role of design in this conversation, and not just art. And hopefully we can make a difference. So. Uh, Design Relief is a, a project that was launched um, um, a few months ago by AIGA, which stands for American Institute of Graphic Arts. It sounds really old, but it is old, but it is very important in the States. It represents mostly communication designers through about 60 chapters around the, the States, and the New York chapter is one of the most um, you know, dynamic and the biggest and, and the coolest. Um, led by Willy Wong, who happened to be, um, aside from being the president of this organization, um, the chief um, uh, creative officer of NYC and Company, which is the city's uh, branding and um, design arm. This time around, the idea is to create some sort of participatory model, not only for the designer themselves to participate in something for the greater good of the city, but also a participation model for the communities that we're going to work and I think working with communication designers, whether they're you know, traditional graphic designers or interactive designers or people who are leveraging different kinds of technologies in public spaces, um, I think what's important for us is to try to make the city legible. We hope that design uh, and the design conversation that we'll bring to these neighborhoods will sort of create a sense of um, participation. The idea here is to create, um, from the get-go, a sense of accountability. We want to tell the story of what we're doing. We have to do demonstrate what design can do, not only to our place, but to the design community itself. We're looking at a new definition of the designer. He's no longer in sort of like a lateral um, delivery of a, of a, you know, to a client, but rather is somebody who can engage and mediate and turn design into a tool of engagement as well. It's starting from, we want this to happen, and then you're really thinking if you're not in the agency itself, what questions do I want to ask? Who am I going to ask? And when am I going to ask them? I also think the technique and the way in which you discuss things and how you choose to discuss them are really important. Understand that as soon as you pull a meeting or you write something in an email, people have to respond formally. Therefore, they have to be their most conservative in how they answer you. If you want to have an open dialogue, one-to-one, -one, phone, allow people to talk without feeling like they're being witnessed or they're going to be held accountable. When you do start, Make sure you're starting with uh, partners that you can trust who have experience. Everybody yeah. thinks this work is easy. Believe me, it's the simplest things are not easy. And so you want to make sure that you're stacking the decks for success so that you don't end up having a problem, a failure, and then everybody says never again. You all have assets uh, that are very valuable. So when I partner, let's say, with Governor's Island, you know, being able to have the ferry you know, access has been extraordinary. Get, removing all obstacles and barriers to site permissions mm -hmm. is huge. Having security is enormous. So there are assets that you may take for granted that are extremely important to help save us money because there are things that you can inherently bring to the table. So we started with the question like, what is it that New York doesn't have? And I think that sometimes now people are saying, oh, I have a bunch of empty storefronts. We'll hand those over to artists. Well, we won't give them any money. And then all of a sudden those will become great places. Well, it's hard to animate a storefront. It takes money. So what are the things? How do people want to gather? What are they not able to do? So you have space, but really think more broadly about that. Leslie, when she came to run Governor's Island, went out and met everybody she possibly could. She made an invitation. So it wasn't in the least bit a passive experience. It was extremely
extremely proactive. Art in the public realm, like it has to be someone who's really into that. Plopping a sculpture or taking an exhibit that you were gonna put somewhere, put it somewhere else, that's not art in the public realm. And you know, these these ladies do it really well. Um, and and uh, respecting that, you know, so like what is your space? How are you gonna work with people? But you want people who are excited, truly excited about what it means to make a statement, whether it, how political it is, whatever, uh, in a street, in a plaza, you know, in an underpass, whatever it is. Um, and that is both individual artists, some new organizations, and then I think increasingly you'll find that whatever your traditional cultural anchors are, they're watching all that stuff because the world is changing before their eyes.